Number one, which of these studies describes the key distinction between an observational study and an experimental study? So an observational study um, doesn't influence um, the effect where an experimental study does. So it doesn't have anything to do with the population size, which is what part A is talking about. Um, data is collected in both, so it's not about B. Um, observational studies try to answer a question. Experimental studies do not. They both try to answer a question, so that's not right. Um, so it must be D. And experimental studies directly influence something to see the effect where observ observational studies do not directly influence. So that's the difference. Number two, Elena is interested in whether music affects plant growth. For a science fair project, she'll grow one plant in a room that's normally kept quiet. She'll grow another plant in another room that has classical piano music playing. After two months, she compares the height of the plants. So in this, um, she's got two different rooms. So normally quiet and then one that's um, classical piano music playing. So she's changed something in each room to directly influence what's going on. So this is experimental. So she's trying to just change one thing to see what impact that has on the outcome of the study. So experimental. And then how could she improve her design um, to get to answer the question better? So for this one, um, let me change this. So she could oops, make sure other um, conditions are identical. So such as like light, um, the room temp, some of those other things that could impact growth. Um, and she could also grow more than one plant in each room to just check if um, the impact is across the board on all plants or if it seems to be just impacting one type of plant. So those are a couple of things. Number three, match the description of the study design with the type of study being collected or conducted. Um, so part A says, does a certain multivitamin help people lose weight? Researchers select um, 100 people to participate in a study and assign them to two groups at random. So there's two groups at random. One group is given a multivitamin, the other is given a fake pill. So this is influencing what's happening um, to see if it matters. So that's an experimental study. How do business customers feel? And I can pretty much stop there and say that this one's gonna be a survey um, because it's talking about how people feel. So the business randomly selects 200 customers and asks them to share their opinion. That's a survey. And then C, do truck drivers get into accidents more than people who drive SUVs? So researchers use police records um, of automobile accidents over the past year and vehicle registrations to compare. So this one, they're not changing anything. They're just looking at data to see. So things that have already happened, they're not changing a condition or doing anything like that. So that's just an observational study. Number four, here's the first four stages of a pattern. In stage one, the middle third of a segment length one is removed. Each successive stage continues to remove the middle third of the segment. So we can see that this third is left or is gone. Um, and so then it wants to know how long is the total of the segments in stage one. And so if the original was one third and we subtract it or is one and we subtracted a third off of it, we would have two thirds left. So this one third is missing. We have two thirds left. So then what's the total of the segments in um, stage two? So now they've taken a third of this part away. Um, and so then we want to add all of that up. And so, I don't know, the way I thought about this is this was one third, right? And one third. So now this little piece is a third of this third. So this is a third of a third. 
So this little chunk is one ninth and there's four of them. So I thought of this as one ninth times four and got four ninths. So four of those ninths. So now again, we have, a one, we have one third of the one ninth. So this little piece is one third of the previous segment. So one third of a ninth, which is one twenty seventh for each. And then there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight segments this time. So now we have eight segments at 127th. So then that's going to be 827th for the total in stage three. And then it says Priya says that um, from each stage to the next, the total length is multiplied by a factor of two thirds. Do you agree? So we could take a look at the first one and say two thirds times two thirds. That's four over nine. So that matches what we got. And then if we multiplied this by two thirds again, um, that would be eight on top and 27 on bottom. And that is what we got here. So it's looking like, yes, we agree. Um, and then you could just say there's gonna be two thirds of it left over each time. So just, it would make sense that two thirds um, is left after each piece is removed. Um, and then part E says, write an expression for the total length of segments in stage N. So if we have two thirds at each stage, that would be two thirds to the N. So two thirds to the first would have been that two thirds. Two thirds to the second would have been four ninths. Two thirds to the third would be eight twenty sevenths. Um, so two thirds to the N when N is greater than or equal to one would be an equation for that. Number five, Maya is using the quadratic formula to solve two different quadratic equations. For the first equation, she writes this. For the second equation, she writes this. How many real solutions does each equation have and explain how you know? So we know that the part that impacts the number of solutions is this square root because we know um, that we're gonna do negative four plus or minus this. So if we've got a number in here, we're gonna get two solutions because we're gonna do negative four plus that thing divided by eight, and we're gonna do negative four minus that thing divided by eight. So if we get a number underneath the radical, so if this number is greater than or equal to zero, we're gonna end up with two solutions. If that thing in there is um, equal to zero, Okay, then the square root of zero is just zero, so we're just gonna have negative four over eight. So we're just gonna have one solution. And then if that number inside of there is less than zero, then we're gonna have no real solutions because a square root of a negative number is imaginary. So let's just take a look at that inner portion. So here we've got four squared, which is 16, and then four times four times one is also 16. So this is going to be the square root of zero. So then this is just going to be one solution for that first one. Again, it's going to be negative four over eight since that zeroed out. Then this second one, we've got negative three squared, which is nine. Then we've got four times three, which is 12 times five, which is 60. So we have nine minus 60, which is negative 54, and that's gonna be uh, an imaginary solution. So we're gonna have zero real solutions to this one. Number six, here's the graph of two functions, f and g. Which statements are true about the graph of h of x, which is when we subtract f minus g? So A says there's an x-intercept between x equals 1 and x equals 2. So remember, an x-intercept would be it crosses the y-axis, or the x-axis, and that's going to be where our output is 0. So if these two functions are identical, when we subtract them, they're going to equal 0. So this is going to be um, 0, so it's going to touch here. And we're doing f minus g, so we can see that the f is higher here. So a larger number minus a smaller number is going to be positive. And over here, we're doing F minus G. 
and F is smaller. So that's going to give us back negatives. So for sure, that's going to switch from positive to negative, giving us an X intercept. B, there's an X intercept between two and three. So here's two, here's three. And in this case, um, through this whole interval, our F function is lower than G. So when we do F minus G here, it's going to be less than zero the whole time. So it's never going to cross back over the X axis. So there would not be an X intercept there. Um, part C says that the Y intercept is positive. So the y intercept is going to be here on the y axis. So we're going to be subtracting these two. And remember, we're doing f, this top part here, minus g. So this is a bigger number minus a smaller number. So that's going to be positive. So f minus g is going to be greater than zero, meaning that our y intercept is positive. Um, the y values between zero and one are positive. So the y values between 0 and 1 are positive. So if we look here, remember we're doing f, this blue function, minus g. And everywhere in this interval, the f function is larger than the g function. So that means when we subtract them, it will definitely be positive. So since f is greater than g in that interval, when we do f minus g, we'll have a positive. And then the last one, the y values are negative between 2 and 3. So here was that 2 and 3 interval again. And in this whole interval, the F function is below the G function. So that means um, that the F function is less than the G function. So when we do F minus G, that's going to be less than 0. So definitely negative in that interval.